Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. I move the mic up. Uh, this is, oh, I'm Cheryl Heller. I'm the chair of Design for Social Innovation, and this is the third in our series of webinars. Uh, if you were here last week, you saw Asi Barak talking about games for change, and um, we are going to have uh, a webinar every Tuesday for the rest of this month. Uh, and after that, um, we'll post another schedule for February. So uh, make sure to check back. The reason we're doing all this right now is because the moment has come to apply. Uh, our priority deadline is January 30th, if you're interested. So, um, and we'll be accepting applications after that, but there is definitely an advantage to getting your application in soon. Um, we are working, oh, Erin is here, and she's going to be available to answer any questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, but we've also been working hard to line up a couple of scholarships and a fellowship for um, our accepted students. So um, she can also tell you about that if you email or call. The webinar we're going to um, see tonight and um, Mary Pearl are both um, some of the most important things that um, are the basis of this program. Mary Pearl is uh, an extraordinary conservation biologist. She's a pioneer. She's run a, um, a nonprofit and a big conservation NGO for many years. Uh, she it has been a dean of a sustainability school, and she's got a really extraordinary background doing many other things that she may tell you about. But one of the most important points of all of this is that no matter how innovative we are, no matter how creative we are, no matter what we work on, if we don't understand the laws of nature and if we don't understand the real resources that we have to work with, none of this um, is going to pan out very well. And so this is a really key core understanding that needs to be the basis of any changes to society that we think about. So I will turn it over to Mary and um, just say thank you. And I feel really honored to have you here. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. Um, I have to say uh, that I am uh, uh, pleased and slightly intimidated to be among designers. But uh, I most of all admire your vision and courage in uh, bringing me into the uh, circle of people talking about design for uh, social innovation, because you do see the uh, limits of nature. And in fact, Cheryl um, asked me to talk about innovation powered by the living systems of nature. Um, most specifically, um, two questions. Uh, working within the only rules that matter, those of nature. And um, you know, a, a condor can't sit at the table with a politician and agree to have half the habitat size that uh, he had before. Um, the rules of nature uh, don't lie, and uh, we must respect them. Um, but we can use these limits. Um, to understand, um, the, to form a sort of a discipline and also an inspiration and opportunity. And these are some of the points that I hope to bring up in today's, uh, this evening's remarks. Um, first, I'm going to talk about working within the rules of nature. Um, I'll describe the six characteristics of healthy ecosystems. And then I'll talk about our record um, on behalf of healthy ecosystems, most specifically the six stressors on, on ecosystems. And then the uh, next part of my um, talk will be on um, using the limits of natural systems as inspiration and opportunity. And uh, starting off looking at nature uh, from the uh, perspective of human societies, the six characteristics of happy societies. Um, if I had been Herman Cain, I would have entitled this talk uh, the six, six, sixes of, uh, <laughs> of nature. But I guess that, that would get me in trouble for uh, a satanic cult, right? Isn't that the <laughs> problem with sixes? Anyway, um, let's get uh, underway before I frighten you. Um, so here is the um, outline of my talk. Let's get going in the yellow, the six characteristics of healthy ecosystems. Now you may be saying, well, I know what a healthy ecosystem is. And of course you're right. Anyone can recognize a healthy ecosystem. It's like a Stuart Potter, who is a very famous jurist on the Supreme Court of the United States, was uh, required to define obscenity. And he said, um, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. 
And so for most of us, these are a variety of pictures of healthy ecosystems, but ecologists are a little more specific. And in fact, there are um, six aspects of um, a healthy ecosystem. And the first is a positive feedback to stress. This, this is really the resiliency of a system. It has relatively rapid recoveries. And I um, have a picture here of uh, Sri Lanka. Um, you can see the orange is the southeastern part, a coastline where it was hit by the, the great tsunami. Um, and uh, I was fortunate to be part of a study uh, in Yala National Park, um, which is on the southeastern coast. Um, chronically, from a few hours after the impact, the recovery. And after two years, the only way you would know that uh, a tsunami had taken place was this memorial marker at, at Yala National Park, um, very unlike the uh, built environment uh, that uh, surrounded the park, which took, uh, was probably not even back to, to where it was. Now, the second uh, characteristic is um, maximum biodiversity of native species. That means not invasive invaders, but native species with all trophic levels occupied. And that means all levels of, of feeding. And that beautiful abstract art is, in fact, a photograph of plankton, which are the, some of the smallest organisms in the ocean. They are the uh, baseline food. They are the organisms that take the energy from the sun, convert it to food, and form the base of the food chain that culminates in the top predators, such as the orcas on, on the lower right. Um, and I'll talk to you a little later about what seems to be happening with the plankton. Because if uh, any trophic level is not fully occupied, it can have consequences all along the way. The third is sustainable reproduction rates. And the wildebeest at the bottom of the, the slide will have no trouble finding a mate. Um, it's, um, but uh, the uh, Asian elephants above are not so fortunate. Um, the ratio of males to females um, is so skewed that uh, there's one male for every 100 females in Periyar, India, for example. So the chances of a female finding a, uh, a mate are uh, pretty remote unless there's a human intervention to, to affect a, uh, a match. Um, and so this is an important point. Um, there's population size, and then there's effective population size. Um, the effective population size uh, includes the uh, members of the species of, of the population that are able to reproduce. And there are many reasons, uh, injury, age, um, skewed sex ratio, that can uh, alter that. Um, then we come to number four, genetic diversity. Now, the interesting, well, there are many th interesting things about cheetahs, if, you're, if you like animals the way I do. But uh, one noteworthy aspect of, of them is that they have virtually no genetic diversity. Uh, one cheetah is like another. They're almost like a whole population of identical twins because they went through a bottleneck in their evolution where um, there were only a few members of the uh, species and then they repopulated but did not have the genetic diversity. And this is a vulnerability. In contrast, the rhesus monkeys, there's a, a young one uh, grooming an adult male on the, on the right side, um, they have uh, just a lot of diversity. And what this, and, uh, and then there's a pile of beans. Uh, you know, beans are plants that are so diverse you can uh, have a, a bean any color of the rainbow for dinner. And uh, the, what serious the concept behind this is that in a changing world, in a changing climate, um, an organism or an animal or a plant that has a lot of genetic variation just by random luck is going to have some individuals that are more adapted if the weather suddenly becomes a drought or very wet. And, so um, it's really kind of the, the, the molding clay of, of evolution. An excellent book, if, you, if this intrigues you, an excellent book on the topic of uh, genetic diversity and the rapidity of um, ev uh, evolution is called The Beak of the Finch by Jonathan Weiner. I'll put that on a reading list. I think we should have Absolutely. A, I'll, I'll, I'll be, uh, that, that will be a service to those of you who become <laughs> uh, students here. Um, the fifth is minimal disease. On the right, you see a pretty healthy duck pond filled with a variety of uh, ducks. Um, in any ecosystem, there are going to be um, organisms that cause disease in other species. I mean, viruses and bacteria, they have to live and they have some useful roles. But um, in populations where uh, disease becomes a factor that drives population numbers that affects healthy individuals, then that's a cause for worry. The image on the left is a sea turtle with fibropapillomavirus. That's, you heard me right, that's the same. It's related to the um, uh, human uh, fibropapillomavirus that is uh, 
a, a precursor to uh, cervical cancer. And um, unhappily, it's being discovered in sea turtles around the globe. Um, and uh, we don't really quite know what the mechanism, mechanism is that is, is causing this. And then finally, the sixth, low toxicity in the air, ground, and water. And um, you know, this is, at a glance, you can see I have one healthy, uh, um, low toxic uh, environment and then uh, some uh, problematic uh, areas. But uh, uh, the background of uh, toxicity um, is, uh, causes uh, all kinds of health problems, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So what is our record? The six stressors on ecosystems, let's uh, take a look at them. They're synergistic, which is why I, I sort of present them as a, uh, some puzzle pieces that all fit together because you really can't isolate uh, them. They, they um, really are mutually reinforcing in a, in a terrible uh, vortex. Um, and they include habitat deterioration, which is land conversion or wholesale forest removal. Um, uh, decreasing biological diversity, often a consequence of habitat uh, deterioration or destruction. Toxification, which I just mentioned. Rapid global travel. Um, uh, urbanization. Um, we live in an era, sometime in the last few years, um, marked the first time in human history where more people live in urban environments than the countryside. And that has all kinds of consequences. And then finally, everything that takes place, the other five, is in the context of climate change. So I'd like to talk about uh, each in um, uh, an order in terms of what can we expect of nature given that we are applying these uh, stressors. Um, the first uh, habitat deterioration, I'd like to tell you a, a tale of some work I've been involved in in Brazil. Um, the uh, an animal that we were particularly interested in because it's very sensitive and that it never comes to the ground, it spends its whole life in trees, is the black lion tamarind. That's the little monkey on the right. Um, and uh, this is uh, Brazil. Um, can, uh, on the top, the little yellow state in the south, Sao Paulo state. Sao Paulo is not just a city, but it's in a state. And then if you look down, uh, I've magnified Sao Paulo state. And then if you look at the far western corner, there's a sharp little triangle. And that's a, a place called the Pontal do Parapanema. And that is a... Um, for, uh, it was declared a protected area, oh, maybe 100 years ago. Now, that is this little, <laughs> if we look at the state of Sao Paulo, it stayed, the, the yellow is um, the forested areas, orange is where it's been cleared, and uh, actually Agent Orange was the, the agent of much of the destruction that really took off after 1970 to, um, this is 2000 in the lower right-hand side. Um, uh, where uh, there's a hardly a, a bit of, um, of, it's called Atlantic Forest, uh, left. And this is the, the Great Reserve, that green triangle on the far west. And um, that, was, uh, that, was, those were the, that was the legal boundaries of this reserve. And this is the size it is today. It's on the right, and then there are a few other isolated uh, fragments of uh, intact habitat. And this is the really heartbreaking because the biodiversity in the Atlantic forest is tremendous. And it's not just that there are so many different kinds of species, it's that so many are found nowhere else on the planet. That's what uh, uh, um, endemic uh, species are. So um, the pink endemism, especially if you look at the amphibians, um, it's uh, just uh, tremendous. Almost every species you find, you wouldn't find anywhere else. And yet uh, um, the uh, the place was clear cut. So given that stressor, what, what can we do? Well, you can go into these uh, fragments that are left, create nurseries of native trees, work with people who are newly settled, landless from the landless movement, and make plans for economically valuable forests that include native species that uh, um, are, uh, have many properties that can uh, grow, regrow forests rapidly and then intersperse among them uh, other uh, trees that produce nuts and, and other uh, and, and timber and, and uh, more immediately valuable crops to the landless people. This is a, an aerial shot of a fragment. And one thing I should mention to you is when, for, when habitats get fragmented, um, they, they uh, sort of enter a terrible decline because 
Um, there are uh, a forest by definition has plants that are adapted to shade. And so um, the edges of the forest have too much sunlight. So the whole forest begins to fray. So if you see this line of trees, that's the buffer, or as the Brazilians call it, the green hub, um, that was artificially planted um, by community activists and settled, newly settled landless people to create a, uh, a buffer, and then the forest will regenerate back towards that, uh, that limit. Um, it's a lot harder to rebuild an ecosystem than to, uh, um, than to um, destroy it. And uh, also in addition to the green hug, which you see sort of in brown around a, a fragment in the, the, the design on the lower right, um, there are corridor projects. That's the blue and orange map where you see little lines where they're trying to create bridges. And then uh, one little exciting development, these are called uh, islands of diversity, tiny. I mean, just uh, um, say, uh, uh, 100 square feet of um, grassland with some trees, initially designed to um, protect migratory birds and butterflies uh, moving across a landscape. Um, researchers were astonished that, uh, that jaguars were using them as well uh, to, to move across agricultural landscapes. Um, and then finally, there's management of individual species, of moving them around to mimic what would have been natural uh, distribution of, of species. So the next, uh, this leads to uh, biological diversity impoverishment. And um, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's nice that, uh, you know, all those boosters of nature, they, they love their monkeys, and, uh, but does it really matter? And the answer is absolutely. Now, of course, the charismatic um, megafauna, the orangutans, the rhinos, the polar bears, um, you know, I, I think that there, there's a tremendous cultural value to them. And it's, heartbreaking to think that we live in a world that won't have, ry have uh, rhinos. I think the, um, uh, uh, the Javan rhino is uh, extinct, or nearly so, um, as well as uh, the black rhino, polar bears, habitat disappearing in orangs. But then there's also, um, let's see, disappearing uh, bushmeat and local fish. Every uh, uh, economic fish, commercial fishery, has gone into uh, commercial extinction, which means there's still those fish around, but not viable for collection. Well, as they crash, then protein for local people disappear, and there's tremendous pressure on, um, on uh, the bush meat, which is uh, simply all the animals in, in the forest that people eat when they don't have another source of protein. I mentioned the extinction of commercial fishery. And then there's something else, which is a bit esoteric, but critically important, and that's the lost opportunity Rare species and unusual habitats are the most vulnerable and, in many ways, uh, the most enticing from the perspective of finding species that are solving unusual problems. For example, the, uh, one of the biggest breakthroughs in medicine was uh, the discovery of bacteria that live at very high temperatures in ocean vents. Um, and these are the kinds of uh, uh, important species that could lead to all sorts of uh, design solutions and medical breakthroughs that we lose with biodiversity impoverishment. Um, global toxification. This poor loon died from lead poisoning because of, uh, of, of buckshot. But uh, we have a, a tremendous problem of toxicants in the environment. Now, I know this is a global audience, but um, in the United States alone, there are 11,000 organochlorines in commerce today. DDT, PCBs, dioxins. Now, of course, they make effective pharmaceuticals and, and pesticides, that's because carbon is part of uh, the composition of life. That's why petroleum products are so insidious, because they can get into our organs of our bodies in ways that, um, that uh, inert uh, uh, chemicals cannot. And then there's something called bioaccumulation. Um, Pesticides uh, tend to um, accumulate in the fatty tissues. Then uh, if, uh, um, for example, mice get into uh, eating some toxicants, well, then owls eat the mice, and they accumulate. As it goes up the food chain, the concentration of, um, of toxins gets uh, higher and higher. And, and we're top predators ourselves, so it's not surprising that we have a lot of uh, toxins in our uh, adipose tissue. And uh, one of the saddest uh, things uh, that uh, 
uh, I've heard recently in the animal world is that uh, uh, dolphins in the open sea tend to lose their first, the, the mothers lose their first uh, offspring. It was assumed it was perhaps inexperience, maternal inexperience, until someone looked at their um, milk and it was so loaded with um, toxicants that actually they were killing their, their firstborn calves. And it was only with subsequent uh, offspring where they, after they had shed load, that um, they, uh, they could have live offspring. And we know that uh, pesticides and organochlorines are, are, um, are associated with cancer of all kinds, immune suppression, reproductive <coughs> problems, developmental impairment, uh, behavioral um, anomalies. Um, even you see this in the animal world when, uh, for example, animals uh, don't know their courtship rituals, that, that sort of thing. Um, and they're per per pervasive uh, throughout the globe, and the onus in the United States is not on the industry that introduces an organochlorine, but it's actually the government has to prove that they've made a mistake and that there's a problem. And uh, with the uh, thousands of, um, of, of compounds in commerce, it's, uh, it's lucky if every 15 years there's an analysis of, uh, of a particular product. This talk gets happy in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> then there's rapid global movement of people and, and other uh, living organisms, uh, plus urbanization. And uh, the, um, it's uh, really amazing to see how international travel has grown so rapidly, and uh, projections indicate it will continue to grow. Um, on the left, we have uh, Homus uh, vagabundus americanus. <laughs> and, uh, on the right, um, the SARS virus, um, which uh, is a, um, a pretty deadly uh, respiratory infection that uh, had an outbreak in, uh, in uh, southern China, Hong Kong, uh, some years ago. And the interesting part of it was that um, it was uh, within days it was in Canada because of air travel. And uh, the economic impact of uh, emerging infectious diseases as they move around the world is staggering. And if we look at the SARS, that's the uh, magenta circle, um, it uh, costs $50 billion uh, in terms of its impact. Mostly um, the impact was a fear based People canceled um, all kinds of um, international meetings in Hong Kong and in Toronto and these major uh, centers. Um, Bird flu in Asia, a huge uh, impact in terms of all the expenditures that have to be made, even though relatively few people have, have died from it. And then if you look at this, uh, at this chart, um, the more glo globe-shaped uh, um, uh, diseases uh, r represent impacts of short duration. The gift that keeps on giving, the yellow one, is the Lyme disease in the United States, 6 billion and counting, and it has a steady drumbeat, as does West Nile virus um, in, in flu. So these um, outbreaks are um, driven, they originate from land conversion um, and um, pathogens being forced to adapt to new species, namely our livestock or ourselves, and then rapid travel. And then all of these trends that I've talked about, the, the, the land uh, dis use change, the habitat destruction, the bi uh, biodiversity impoverishment, uh, disease emergence, it all takes place in the context of climate change. Um, if there's anyone on this um, uh, webinar who thinks that uh, uh, the climate isn't warming, um, uh, you know, get real. You're not allowed in the program. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just a fact. I mean, I think some people argue on the margins of what it's causing it, but uh, um, like my mother used to say when my sister and I were fighting, I don't care who started it. <laughs> <You know> <laughs> we have to uh, do something about this. And uh, the IPCC um, tells us, uh, this is the envelope on the right-hand side of how much the temperature is going to continue to rise. It's not a question of uh, is it going to or not. We are on a trajectory that is um, unprecedented in history, and it's not uh, just the, the temperature, it's the uh, amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Um, so we know that the global average surface temperature has increased over the last century. It's going to continue to rise. We also know that many areas have seen increases in rainfall, and we know that floods will increase. By the same token, um, many areas will have um, intensity of droughts increase. 
it's really called sort of hydrological extremes are uh, going to uh, increase. And uh, El Nino um, has been more frequent, persistent, and intense, and it has all kinds of impacts on uh, fisheries and climate, and uh, that trend is uh, probably going to continue. Um, warmer temperatures have tremendous effects. They affect diseases transmitted through water, like cholera. Like, uh, the cholera likes warmer water. Or even uh, mosquito-borne um, malaria, dengue. And in New York, where, where I live, a West Nile virus um, has uh, larger outbreaks in hotter summers because the virus itself is more comfortable in, in hotter weather. Um, the European heat waves of 2003 and 2010 um, had tremendous impacts of, uh, of uh, thousands, tens of thousands of deaths above the uh, expected rate of, uh, of mortality for, for given periods. These are sort of the direct offtake of, uh, of life. Carbon in the atmosphere is at a point where it's never been as high in the last 420,000 years. So there's no one around to remember what it was like. We just don't know what kind of impact it's going to have. Um, the uh, steady state before the Industrial Revolution was 275 parts per million. Um, this has impact not only in the atmosphere, but in the oceans as well. Um, uh, the oceans are a natural reservoir of CO2. Um, 22 million tons of uh, carbon are sequestered every day. The little worker bees in, uh, in this are the plankton I mentioned. Now with warmer temperatures, um, the nutrients at the bottom of the ocean that come up to uh, feed the plankton so they can do their business of uh, photosynthesis, um, this is uh, delayed or, or much diminished in uh, warm water. Um, so we may find that uh, the plankton are dying off. We also know that uh, at every time as we add more and more CO2 into the oceans, it reduces the availability of something called carbonate ions. And these are used, uh, you know, shells and coral are calcium carbonate. And so they, um, we may see in the coming decades uh, coral and, and shellfish unable to create their, um, their shells and their, uh, their structures. Extreme weather events um, are on the increase. This is a picture of uh, the Hurricane Katrina, which had such a devastating effect in, uh, in 2005. Um, it's uh, cyclones, floods, hurricanes. Um, uh, we can uh, say that, uh, you know, that I think it was the uh, World Health Organization uh, said that over 600,000 deaths uh, occurred in the 1990s due to extreme weather. Um, but um, it doesn't begin to tell the story of the uh, disruption of communities and the environmental refugees who are created by these uh, events. Our air pollution health effects are very um, uh, well known over long term. People know that asthma occurs in, in communities that, that have uh, truck routes running through them. Um, that lung disease and cancer can occur after decades of exposure. But particulate matter in the air can actually uh, bring about death in days, not, not decades. Um, within three to four days of extreme uh, weather inversions in Shanghai, for example, hospital emissions for stroke and heart attack go, go up. Um, you can go to the World Health Organization uh, website and see uh, a, a version of this uh, a uh, slide I'm going to be sharing with you now of the, uh, it, it sort of summarizes the health effects of uh, climate change, but it actually was the brainchild of someone named Jonathan Patz at the University of Wisconsin. Um, there's the urban heat island effect, which is uh, like the uh, heat outbreaks in, in Europe, um, you know, direct uh, you know, heart attacks, people expiring from, from uh, heat exhaustion. Then there's air pollution in the allergens um, causing respiratory diseases and asthma. Then there are vector-borne diseases. These are the ones that are carried by bats and, and um, rats and, uh, and ticks and mosquitoes, malaria, dengue, uh, encephalitis, hantavirus, um, and uh, Rift Valley fever are some examples. Um, then there are waterborne diseases like the cryptosporidium that uh, are um, going to become more prevalent again as water is warmer. And, uh, the uh, water resources and food supply, um, as we have extreme water uh, events, uh, is going to be compromised. And um, as we have more, say, cholera, we'll have more malnutrition and diarrhea. 
And then I mentioned earlier we have the environmental refugees, forced migration. Um, I was actually living in Pakistan at a time when there was a tremendous drought in Afghanistan, and a million Afghanis moved across the border to Pakistan, and they brought with them three million goats. And uh, so the impact on the, uh, on the populist social disruption and the environmental disruption of these kinds of uh, mass movements because of uh, weather events, uh, that, that, that that's going to increase. So um, let's, let's get happy, okay? <laughs> let's talk about using the limits of natural systems as inspiration and opportunity. And I, I want to talk about the six characteristics of happy societies. What brings us happiness? And uh, one thing that uh, Cheryl didn't tell you is I spent some time as the CEO of a, of a retreat center, and a lovely uh, Buddhist blessing is uh, the metta practice, which is may you be healthy, may you be safe, may you be happy, um, may you um, live a life of ease. And uh, this really maps to, you know, may you be healthy. Um, this is, oh gosh, what happened? Ah, yes, here we are. May you be healthy, may you be safe. Um, and that's tied to security, shelter, and food. Um, may you live a life of ease, and that's a means to earn a living and uh, spiritual well-being. So I would argue and I admit part of it is wanting to have groups of six for everything tonight. I don't know what motivated me to do that, just be a good mnemonic. But I would argue that these are the ingredients of a flourishing life. And um, I think that um, uh, a case can be made that none of this is possible without healthy ecosystems. So I'm going to elaborate on that, um, how nature helps fulfill these characteristics. So. Um, there's a, uh, I imagine uh, some of you have heard the term ecosystem services. That's just the shorthand for all that nature does for us. And um, um, people typically um, break these down into um, four categories. There are provisioning services. That's when we get honey from the bees and uh, fruit of the vine and apples from trees. Um, and then there's um, regulating uh, services. That's when um, a, a humble animal like this lovely dung beetle takes a, a bolus of fecal matter from the woods and buries it. Um, it's um, really uh, doing the work of converting um, waste into uh, energy for regrowth of, of the forest. Um, also, reg trees regulate the flow of water through watersheds. Then there are the uh, supporting um, services, the basic primary productivity of, um, of uh, photosynthesis. Um, and then the cultural um, service uh, that uh, really uh, time in nature is so um, important for, uh, for all cultures. Um, now when we talk about, I'd like to talk about sort of each of the, the, the six requirements of sort of happiness and start with um, health. And uh, nine of the top 10 drugs are of plant origin. And of the 100, 150, 108 have come out of uh, nature. Um, and um, also, it's not just that there are products that make us healthy, like the aloe vera for our skin or the rosy periwinkle that produced an anti-cancer um, compound, but biodiverse ecosystems buffer the spread of diseases. When you have a lot of different species um, and you have, say, a tick coming in, um, it will bite uh, a whole variety of species and not no one will be singled out um, uh, for um, for disease. An example here in uh, northeastern United States is that we have this disease, West Nile virus, that really only bothers people in the fall of the year. And the reason for that isn't because uh, the mosquitoes just bite at that time or that the virus only likes the you know, autumn in New York. Um, it's because um, the mosquito that causes the disease, 95% of the time, it bites birds rather than any other kind of uh, organism. And of the birds, it loves robins. It's like the robins are the chocolate cake of the uh, uh, Pippian's uh, 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 mosquito. Um, and so when the robins uh, start going south for the winter, um, the mosquitoes are at a loss. And because there's so many humans in the New York area, uh, there's just enough spillover onto uh, human bites uh, by these uh, mosquitoes, Vivex pipians, that typically um, only bite birds. So uh, robins really buffer our, uh, 
our safety. And that's true of so many uh, uh, diseases. Um, safety and security, I think, to a great uh, extent, is um, having enough water, safe water, uh, for sanitation, for consumption, having uh, food security, enough to eat, um, flood control, and microclimate modulation. Um, plantings um, really create the kind of uh, um, microclimate that uh, moderates extreme uh, temperatures. Um, well, food uh, could be the subject of a, a whole talk. I thought I'd just mention pollinators because globally on every continent there has been a uh, massive decline of pollinators. And uh, um, it's really shocking. It's shocking to me that um, fully one third of the American diet, and a really important part, all the nuts and the fruit, uh, are pollinated by bees. Am almonds alone, a $2 billion industry in California. And yet our government and national uh, agricultural statistics don't uh, even collect information on abundance of pollinators. They look at, at uh, honey production um, declines, but um, it, it, can you imagine any uh, company producing a, uh, a product where um, a key uh, element of the workforce is, is unknown and unaccounted for? It's, um, it's really troublesome, and uh, we never uh, take into account the wild pollinators. And um, there are a whole uh, variety of causes. There's habitat loss. Fragmentation, and this is important for migratory pollinators like hummingbirds and, and butterflies because um, they need to have uh, the uh, plants flowering at the right time during their migration. And as climate changes and the flowering dates change and get out of sync, we may lose all our migratory pollinators. Um, and uh, especially given the fragmented nature of the, these uh, areas. Um, agricultural and grazing practices. Um, we know that we have uh, we, we lose our abundance and biodiversity of pollinators when we have monocultures. And then there's pesticide use, the organoclarines I mentioned, and introduction of non-native species. Because uh, in any uh, environment, any ecosystem, the um, pollinators evolved along with the plants. And in some cases, um, there are stories in the rubber plant, for example. Um, has to be pollinated by a particular kind of carpenter bee. Um, and so when the plants were first uh, moved from uh, South America to Asia, the fact that these, these very strong bees that can open the flower weren't there uh, uh, meant that, they, uh, that, that they, their, the agricultural uh, would, not, uh, would not be successful until they actually brought the pollinators. And then shelter um, goes without saying, uh, sustainable building materials, whether it's uh, mud or, or timber, uh, come from nature. And uh, a means to make a living. Um, I mentioned uh, bushmeat um, that people need to eat, especially after uh, um, the decline of fisheries. The University of California, Berkeley, did a study over 30 years in Ghana and saw sharp declines in over 40 species of uh, land um, animals. There's an urgent need to find cheap protein alternatives and also alternative livelihoods. Um, I've done some work in Brazil where um, instead of collecting uh, forest products, um, people started making um, uh, uh, clothes using um, collected um, uh, used clothing but creating new patchwork uh, materials and designs that were then uh, sold. Um, I, I was once involved in a, a project in Malaysia where um, the village had uh, existed for millennia. Suddenly it was a national park. And suddenly people were told they could not collect uh, trees in the forest anymore, even once they had planted themselves. And um, the government actually hired me to see, well, what, what, what did they want? I think they were thinking it was going to be a payoff. And um, they said, no, we want business uh, professors from the National University to come and tell us how we can uh, create a, uh, a boating uh, uh, business. And um, you know, so uh, people all over the world are pretty sophisticated when they're uh, uh, aware of their uh, options and um, opportunities that are, are possible. Um, at this point in the talk, I would just like you all to look at this photograph. Um, soften your gaze. Look at it. Just think of your eyes resting like uh, they're in hammocks in your, in your eyes. And uh, 
I want to tell you that I took this picture in Aspen, Colorado last summer. Um, I was uh, feeling the sun in that uh, high altitude uh, environment where it feels so uh, bright and sharp, and I was smelling the air, which was uh, fragrant from having blown through so many um, evergreens and, and aspen trees. And so I'd just like you to, to take a deep breath on, uh, say, just breathe in on it for four seconds. Hold it, eight seconds. And let it out slowly. And now I'd like you to close your eyes and think of a beautiful place that you've been that when you think about it, it just makes you say, ah. Oh. Hey, that was brought to you as a little interlude to, uh, to really um, remind yourself how, uh, how we do um, depend on nature. And uh, depending where you come from, um, being tied to the land is something uh, I think that uh, uh, urbanites um, or people who come from um, uh, families that have uh, sort of been, say, in military careers or such, uh, do not appreciate uh, the extent to which um, uh, human um, cultural values are, are based on a relationship with uh, their habitat. So um, now I'd like to really conclude this uh, talk um, with uh, how an understanding of ecosystems can inspire sustainable innovation. Um, I hope the remarks I've made so far, I've talked about so many problems that the creative problem solvers among you, I'm sure, are already thinking of, of solutions. Um, nature is an analogy and an inspiration um, for structure, for process, and for design. Um, in terms of structure, an ecosystem, you know, technically an ecosystem is simply all the species of animals and plants and fungi, all the organisms, and their substrates, whether it's the air, uh, the water, or, or land, um, uh, interacting among one another and transferring energy. And this triangle is everywhere, from trophic level to human organization. Um, you can see, if you think in terms of... Uh, this transference of energy um, from the many uh, to the few. Um, and uh, it also is a process that we can see everywhere, which is to say adaptation where a, a species, an organism, uh, is increasingly suited to where it is. And then there is um, uh, a specialization uh, where um, animals become so particularly um, adapted to a particular space that animals that were once quite similar, maybe part of the same species, differentiate to the point where they no longer uh, can be said to be part of the same species. Um, and uh, a lot of this change is due to competition among species. Now, you know, I could give a, a whole semester's uh, worth of lectures on evolution, but that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. Um, so I would really encourage you to delve deep into how nature works in this, in this way of adaptation, specialization, and competition. And then for design, nature is a tool. In the paper this morning, um, I read about some scientists who are collecting fecal matter from uh, the giraffes at the Atlanta Zoo because the bacteria, there's a bacterium they find in this fecal matter that is uh, breaking down cellulose, which is the... Uh, it's really the surprisingly difficult task that is required to create biofuels from cellulose. Um, but, uh, so we can use nature as a tool, but nature is also an inspiration. And um, I think you all know about the concept of biomimicry, but it wouldn't be a complete talk if I didn't uh, talk to you about biomimicry. For those of you uh, who are not familiar, this is a new science that studies nature's model and then emulates these forms or processes or systems or even strategies to uh, solve human problems and solve them in a way that doesn't create new problems. And uh, an example is the prairie dog burrow. Um, it's designed for airflow. Um, uh, what uh, is remarkable about prairie dogs is they create these underground chambers that uh, by any um, prediction would uh, actually become awful and stagnant. But because they have these, if you look at the top, at the ground level, surface level, there are these little mounds, and they're not random. They create one-way airflows 
that um, actually keep uh, air moving. So the applications, uh, this is, uh, if you look at the white at the bottom, that's not another non-human uh, um, nest. That's actually some housing. Um, using principles of, um, of ventilation that the prairie dog figured out. And uh, one can imagine this being used um, in uh, tunnels and for heating and cooling um, just by adjusting the, uh, the shape of the, of the tunnel and the shapes of the, uh, of the mound. Um, another product that already exists, uh, a Japanese company called the uh, Lixil Corporation, has an exterior wall coating that is self-cleaning. It's modeled on the shell of a snail, which has a, a pattern of tiny bumps that uh, create uh, these tiny uh, pools of water that then uh, uh, oil-based contaminants float on them, and then when it rains, it, it washes clean. Um, there's another uh, very similar sort of uh, shell. This is on a beetle in Namibia that lives in an area where um, there is um, uh, only fog, no rain. Uh, Lima Peru is another place that has fog and hardly any rain. And so when fog appears, this beetle you know, crouches in a certain way, water droplets form on the bumps, and then they go into these troughs that lead directly to the mouth of this, of this beetle. And of course, uh, one can think of all sorts of things uh, of, uh, for a uh, roof um, a collection of water in, uh, in areas that uh, only have fog and not rain. Um, and it's important to note that these species, endemic species, species that are uh, adapted to their habitat, accomplish these design solutions and they are enhancing rather than reducing the uh, natural environment that sustains them. And that's what um, all human endeavor should, uh, to be, should have as a goal, to enhance the natural environment. And these are my final thoughts to you before we get to some questions. Um, the, my, on the micro level, break apart problems to create multiple solutions at the micro level, like the little beetles in their shells. But also consider the ecological framework, the energy flows, the adaptation, the competition, the speciation. Best solutions come from reframing problems through many lenses and through many diverse people. Um, so uh, on your behalf, I'll protest to my talking so long because I'm just one person and the best ideas come out of conversation. And one set of excellent sources of inspiration and discipline, energy and humility, is nature. So thank you very much for that. I will just uh, put my, uh, my, my outline of my talk and, and uh, invite the questions. I guess, Erin, do you yeah. have uh, some? So if you have questions, now would be a great time to type them into the chat box, and we will start going through them. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions. I don't know, Cheryl, if you want to talk about some examples of people who are working in the field, but that time could be awesome. Sure. Well, I only one thought, and thank you, Mary. That was wonderful. One thought to relate everything that Mary talked about and everything that Mary could talk about because she's such a wealth of knowledge um, to design is that every single thing we create has an effect on this ecosystem. And if we're going to be responsible and if we're going to really create the kind of change that is going to improve the situation we're in, and it's really imperative that we see and understand these ecosystems. And it's not about us all becoming scientists and spending the time that Mary's um, spent, but it's about raising our awareness and our ability to see and our ability to understand that absolutely everything we do has consequences and that we need to keep that in mind. And then the second thing that relates to design is that Mary said this at the end, there is absolutely no more trusted, inspiring, um, exciting, uh, novel, huge um, place as a resource for a guide to how we can design the nature because it is the most elegant, the most extraordinary uh, resource for looking around and, and that has, it's a resource for when we think about how to organize a meeting how to organize a business, um, how to design a service or a product, every single thing that we need to design, there is uh, an example in nature and there is a rule in nature that will make what we do more sustainable and more successful and more elegant. So, um, so there. 
but <laughs> that's what it has to do design. And Erin wants me to talk about one of the really exciting people in our network um, is uh, two young men who have founded a company called Ecovative Design. And what they do is grow a replacement for plastic from mushrooms. So they are working to replace styrofoam. Companies are buying it. They work on an island in the Hudson River called Green Island. And they're already shipping product to technology companies and furniture companies. And the, the, they basically uh, use a combination of agricultural waste, which I talked about, and mushrooms. And it's completely biodegradable. But that's a perfect example of um, inspiration from nature changing dramatically the way we think about things and providing not just poor substitutions, but extraordinary new ways of thinking just by paying attention to nature. And I think also um, we, uh, when you talk about mushrooms and you know completely harmless, um, there's a, an inspiring book by uh, William McDonough called Cradle to Cradle mm -hmm. where he argues that we should be able to eat everything that mm -hmm. we manufacture. And so it's really, when you have that ethos, you start to think about that and the unintended consequences of toxicants all around us, to pick up a hand lotion and see that it says for external use only, as if we don't have pores, mm -hmm. um, it's, um, it really defies common sense. I think we really need to recognize that we are unusual animals, but we're not exceptional. Mm -hmm. We are um, organisms that are part of ecosystems. and. Um, and so we cannot um, pretend otherwise. And uh, so if we re-examine every design solution with a view towards uh, good health and sustainability, um, then it does bring us to nature and nature's uh, solutions. And there's another website um, that you may all know about called Ask Nature, asknature.com, which is a compendium. It's a wonderful, it's a wiki, really where uh, all scientists and, and, and entrepreneurs are invited in to talk about solutions um, in nature or solutions inspired by nature, and that you can search by uh, problems to be solved. Great. Um, one other thought to add is that, that in the way that we think of design, we also think about using design to change people's behavior. So it's beyond things that we make. It's communication that we create. It's messages that we make. It's thinking also about how we can be leaders in helping to get um, people in general to think about how we behave in a different way. And how structures make us behave. Mm -hmm. um, because there are, uh, you know, we are a species that evolved. I'm a primatologist by background. I studied dominance interactions and, and, and hierarchies of, uh, of dominance. And um, there's an architecture that it can be friendly and mm -hmm. reinforcing of social behavior or not, and I think that uh, the behavioral sciences are going to play a very, uh, well, a, an important role in design. Great. Well. So um, just one word, next Tuesday, uh, some uh, authors of a book called Reboot Your Life, who happen also to be friends of Mary's and mine, are going to come and talk about that. So it's how to take a moment, think about what's really important to you, and figure out a way to do it. And we thought it was particularly appropriate as people are thinking about um, taking, uh, taking, making a commitment to um, a graduate program. So uh, an, an illustration of how um, the inside of you is important, and well-being and personal sustainability is important, and so is obviously the well-being of the earth. So um, with that, Erin? Um, it looks like we have a very large but very quiet We do have a large but very quiet. Feel free a to. A lot of tweeting going on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, feel free to send us questions. And um, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Mary Pearl, Dr. Mary Pearl. We actually have one question oh. that just came up from Jason Murdoch. He said, I have a challenge getting design students to engage in systems thinking after mm -hmm. having been through an educational system that rewards reductive, linear thinking. Do you have any suggestions to break this reductive, linear thinking and start thinking more holistically? Get them outside. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that's sort of bingo. I mean, I, I, it's, it's not uh, just your students. It's our whole uh, Cartesian approach to solving problems is breaking them apart as opposed to, you know, looking at flows.
flows of energy. Well, I hope some of you will decide to uh, join our program. It's very exciting. There, there. Sometimes the uh, programs are exciting for students, but to have one that's really exciting for faculty too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a great night. Bye bye.